Uh, hey, we're in the second week of a teaching series called Forgotten Voices, and I, I mentioned this last week. We began this teaching series back in October of 21, so a couple years ago, and it's a series where we look at the minor prophets, and I said then that, hey, there's 12 of these guys, and we can't cover them all in one month, and so we'll come back to it, and now we've, we've kind of come back to it here down the road. Uh, these minor prophets, you know, they're not called minor prophets because they're not important. They're actually very important. They have really powerful messages, actually, if you kind of listen uh, to what they have to say. They're, they're called uh, minor because they have relatively short ministry span. The books are short. Uh, they were forgotten by their own people. They're forgotten today by Christians. I mean, if you go, if you walk to any Christian today and, and, and talk to them and say, hey, uh, can you tell me about Zephaniah or uh, Habakkuk, you know, or Obadiah? You know, you're like, okay, <laughs> Habakkuk, like where, where are these guys at? Like you have to turn the table of contents to find, which is okay. Don't ever be ashamed to turn the table of contents to find somewhere where you should go in scripture. It's all right. It's why it's there. But a lot of Christians don't know those guys either. They're they're just not well known, but they have great messages and they're powerful messages. And so we're going to take the time to kind of unpack some of them here. And uh, they ministered in an era where the Jewish people were really divided. Like you think we're divided today. The election, Lord help us, is like three weeks away from today. Okay, so uh, if you think we're real tribal today and divided and everything's tense, you should be in Israel uh, 2,000, 2,500 years ago. Because in this time period when the minor prophets prophets are ministering, the Jewish people are actually divided uh, all the way. There's no like, well, we're kind of tense. No, there's two different kingdoms. That's how, that's how far they took that, okay? There's the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And so the Jewish people aren't even united any longer. They're split. In 722 BC, the Assyrians come in from what's today northern Iraq and they destroy Israel. And if, if Assyria sounds familiar, last week we talked about the story of Jonah, probably the most well-known known minor prophet. And Jonah was, was sent by God to the Assyrians, to the capital of Nineveh, right? So they come in in 722 BC, they destroy uh, Israel. They don't carry everybody off into exile. Instead, what they do is uh, they, they take a big chunk of the population, put them somewhere else, leave the poorest of the poor in the land, and then they bring other people they conquered and settle them in Israel. The Assyrians would do that. That way you wouldn't have any kind of nationalistic pride swell up and, and cause you to revolt. So what happened was the remaining Jews married these Gentiles, these non-Jewish people brought from other places, and that became what was called the Samaritan race. If you look at the New Testament, you read about the Samaritans. This is who these people are. This is how they got started, okay? It was from that right there. Then in 586 BC, Judah, the southern kingdom, gets destroyed by Babylon, and Babylon is not like Assyria. Everybody goes back three different waves of exile. They all go back uh, in exile to uh, what is today. Today, Iraq, right outside of Baghdad. That's where they were at. Uh, both kingdoms failed to listen to the messages that God had uh, through these minor prophets, man, and other prophets as well. And, and God did what he said he would do. He's like, man, if you don't listen to me, if you don't turn, I have to judge you. It's going to, like, my grace is there. At some point, the judgment's got to come. You know, like, I, I think sometimes we treat God, this is kind of an aside, but I think sometimes we treat God as if his grace will never run out. You know, we can just keep printing more of God's grace. It'll, just, it'll never run out, man. God will always give me second chances. And God gives you second, third, fourth, fifth, crazy amount of chances, right? But at some point, just like with the parents, you can't let your kid go on forever before consequence. At some point, if you haven't turned, God, God's going to say, hey, enough's enough. I've warned you a thousand times. You didn't turn. I gave you chances. You're going to have to lie in the bed you've made. And that's what happened with the, with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. Now, something else happens. The, the, the Persians come in. I know we're giving you a history lesson, but I hope you help you understand Scripture a little bit. The Persians come in and they conquer Babylon. And when the Persians conquer Babylon, there's an emperor named Cyrus who decides, you know what? I want everybody that the Babylonians conquered to go back to their homeland because I want them to to worship their gods and and hopefully their gods will look favorably upon us. So what does he do? He releases everyone, including the Jews, to go back to Israel. It ends 
ends this 70-ish year uh, captivity that the, the Jewish people found themselves in. So they go back to the land of Israel. And once they get back there, many of the Jews begin to rebuild. They begin to rebuild Jerusalem, the temple, but it, it's kind of an off and on project. And it takes a long time because there's a lot of opposition that comes their way. This is the world of guys like Ezra and Nehemiah and like the minor prophet we'll talk about today, a guy named Zechariah. Zechariah is, is in this time period. And, and, and as they're trying to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city, all that opposition springs up. And it's kind of like that constant stop and go, stop and go, stop and go that they've kind of experienced. And for a lot of the Jews, to see traditional enemies oppose what they're doing and, 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 and to see that work start start and then stop and then start and then stop it really felt discouraging if you read that about that time period and you read those books i mentioned earlier Ezra Nehemiah like you discover there was a lot of defeated uh, emotion in the atmosphere. I mean, they really felt hopeless is a good word. They really felt hopeless with what they were facing. And I don't know about you, man, this morning, but I don't ever presume people come in to Radiant Church every week or if you're listening or watching right now. Like, I don't presume that you guys have had amazing weeks and things are going great, you know? Everyone will tell you fine, right? How are you doing? I'm fine, Pastor. Like, no one wants to tell you they're not doing fine, but I realize that there are folks who struggle. And it might, be, it might have been a tough week for you. It might be a tough season for you right now. The phase of life or season of life you're in could be really difficult for you here this morning. And maybe you feel hopeless. I don't know. Like you feel you're, you're in a hopeless situation. Or maybe you feel not hopeless, but like you're in here today and you feel discouraged and you feel defeated. You know, and you just feel like, man, I just don't know how my kid will get out of this mess. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how fill in the blank. Maybe that's how you feel today, a little bit, right? And if that's you, like Zechariah experienced those same emotions. His people experienced the same kind of emotions in this time period. One of the things I love about, about the Bible is this. You know, Scripture's got a lot of things in it that are great, but one of the things I love is that the Bible is full of stories of real people with real struggles. It, it doesn't gloss over faults, you know? So many other uh, books and works that are out there try to puff everything up, but Scripture doesn't do that. David, who is the man after God's own heart, he's a murderer, by the way. Uh, you know, you, you've got Elijah, who was, you know, had this great big display of God's power with the prophets of Baal and fire coming, and yet Elijah battles depression. Noah, who built the big boat and all the animals came on. Noah was a drunk. Like, you know, God does not just sweep under the rug all the faults. Scripture shows you good, bad, and ugly, because that's how life is. We are, we are flawed odd individuals. Zechariah, he would have felt the ups and downs, I'm sure, of the people in his day. And so what does God do? God gives Zechariah messages filled with hope, a lot of hope in the book of Zechariah. He wants his people to know they're not forgotten. The name Zechariah actually means the Lord remembers. God had remembered his people. He would restore the nation. He would take care of the Jewish individuals, the Jewish people, right? And what the people did not know was that these messages Zechariah gives, they contained hope reaching far beyond just national Israel. They pointed to a hope that would be available to every one of us. Hope, we'll learn about here today, hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. Zechariah is the one minor prophet of the 12 books. This one right here contains more prophecy and more detail about Jesus and who he is and what he would do than any of the other minor prophets. It's one of the top books in the Old Testament, by the way, that contains prophecy about Jesus as well. In fact, the only book I think that beats it out is Isaiah. So what I want you to know this morning is if you feel like me and my back's against the wall, I feel discouraged, I feel kind of defeated a little bit. Hey, there is hope for you today, and there's hope that relies in who Jesus Christ is, who he is. I want to take you to Zechariah 6 today. Zechariah 6. It's 14 chapters. It's the longest one of the Minor Prophets. But I want to take you to Zechariah 6. I've got a lot of reading I want to do from Scripture here today because I want you to see some things here. Zechariah 6, verse number 9. 
Then I received another message from the Lord. Heldai, Tobijah, and Jediah will bring gifts of silver and gold from the Jews exiled in Babylon. And as soon as they arrive, meet them at the home of Josiah, son of Zephaniah. It's a lot of ayahs I just read right there, buddy. Accept their gifts and make a crown from the silver and gold. Then put the crown on the head of Yeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and tell him, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Here is the man called the branch. He will branch out from where he is and build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he will build the temple of the Lord, and then he will receive royal honor and will rule as king from his throne. And he will also serve as priest from his throne, and there will be perfect harmony Harmony between the two roles. Yeshua, familiar name, right? Sounds very familiar. Why is that? Because Yeshua is the Hebrew for Jesus. Jesus is Greek. Jesus and Joshua are the same name, right? They, 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 if you kind of follow history linguistically, which I don't want to do to here today, but if you follow that history a little bit, Jesus and Joshua kind of get distinguished a little bit in the 17th century. But, but in, in Greek, it's the same. Joshua, Jesus, Yeshua in, in the Hebrew. And in Zechariah's day, you have Yeshua who pops up and God goes, hey, bring this guy over to the house. He's the son of the high priest. Make this, this this crown, set it on his, on his head, and, and then give him, give him this prophecy, right, that he's going to rebuild the temple, and he's going to have this role of priest and king, and, you know, and also let him know that he's the branch. Now, I don't know about you, but if I get a crown put on my head, I want to be like Andrew the Mighty, or Andrew the Strong, or Andrew the Dragon Slayer. I don't want to be Andrew the Branch. <laughs> it just does not sound really cool. Like, you're the branch. Uh, but there's a reason for that. And, and if you look at it on the surface, you're like, that's kind of odd. Why would God say he's the branch? That's such a weird kind of thing. And, and, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But Yeshua, would re, he would build the temple and rule as king and priest. Well, the temple did get rebuilt for sure, but Yeshua never became the, the priest and he never became the king in that dual role. He didn't, he didn't rule that way. So what, what was all this about then? Well, there are moments in Scripture that you read on the surface and you think, okay, that didn't happen, so was God wrong or God off? No. Oftentimes in Scripture, there's a lot of things that happen prophetic. I gotta be really careful that I don't go way over here, but I get, I get kind of nerded out with this kind of stuff. There, there's a couple of ways prophecy works. There's futuristic prophecy where God gives a, 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 an, or, an oracle, right? Hey, in the year 2035, it's gonna rain you know, manna from heaven all over again. And then it happens. You're like, oh my gosh, God said that. Okay, cool. There is prophecy that has a immediate fulfillment, Right? Hey, when you cross the street tomorrow, this is what's going to take place. But then there is prophecy that has both immediate and later fulfillment. This is, this is the prophecy of Emmanuel. Christmas time is fixing to come up, and we all love Christmas. And we're like, you know, you read this prophecy of, of Emmanuel, and Isaiah says there's going to be a child who will you'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That prophecy meant nothing to King Ahaz, because that doesn't help him in the present situation. There was a, a child born, which was given the name Emmanuel, which reminded Ahaz God's with him. It was actually Isaiah's kid. But Isaiah was also, without knowing it, looking into the future and giving a prophecy of God actually being with us in the form of Jesus. So prophecy has kind of three layers to it. Give you a very quick rundown, right? In this scenario, it's, it, it's not for the immediate, it's for the future. It's for the future. It's down the road. Yeshua's in the room, but this is not the same Yeshua. There'll be another Yeshua who comes along, man, and God is speaking about Jesus. How Jesus would come in, and he would destroy, the, remember what he says, he goes, hey, I, I will destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. And everyone kind of laughed at him, like, what do you mean? It took forever to build this thing. He was talking about his body, his life. I will die. Three days later, I will live again, right? Right? He would destroy himself and then rise again from, from the dead. And, and so you got a guy like Matthew who's following Jesus. He's all this kind of stuff happened. He, he's writing his gospel. Matthew writes his gospel somewhere in the AD 50s or so, middle of the first century. And as he's, Matthew's writing his gospel, Matthew is studying the Old Testament. You know, this guy, Jesus that I follow, this Yeshua, man, he fulfilled all kinds of Old Testament prophecy. And then I'm in Zechariah, and I'm like, man, you know what? 
This, this thing about the branch sounds really, where, why does branch stand out? I mean, he, Jesus fulfilled all the roles. Where does branch come from? And Matthew has a light bulb that goes off. Jesus is from Nazareth. He said, why does that matter? Nazareth means branch. And so what God is doing is God, it's almost like Matthew looks at this thing, and, and if you read Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, Matthew says, this fulfilled what the prophets had said, that he'll be called a Nazarene. Well, there are no prophecies saying he's called a, you know, the Messiah would be a Nazarene. But what Matthew does, he looks at the prophecy of Zechariah, and he goes, man, Jesus fulfilled the priest role, the king role. He fulfilled all the roles in the Old Testament, and yet God says he's going to be the branch. This cannot be coincidental. So Matthew thinks it's like, it's like God saying this, that Jesus would come from, you know, Branchville, you know, town of the branch, that's Nazareth, and he would, he would be the one that God uses to save us from our sin and fulfill the role that Zechariah meant. And this has to be the guy the prophet spoke about. Now, that happens not too often, but every so often in Scripture. And he said, well, before you said, well, Pastor, you, how, do you, how do you put any faith in that? Well, look, we do things all the time like this, where we say, man, there's too much happening here to be a coincidence. Like, I, I, all, all the dots are together, all the T's are crossed, all the I's are done. There's no way this is just happenstance. This can't be coincidental. Well, we do that kind of stuff all the time. Matthew is doing the same thing as he writes his gospel, and he looks at this passage right here, and he goes, man, this is Jesus. He is going to fulfill this role. He came from, it has to be about him. Now, what does this tell me about Christ? Well, it, it tells me a few things about Jesus here this morning. I just want to walk down a, a few key attributes of who he is and, 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 and what that means for us today, because I think they're pretty important. I think, first of all, it tells us this, that, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. He's one of us. He's one of us, okay? Jesus is one of us. I love, from Genesis to Revelation, the story arc of the Bible. You know, so many other faiths and pathways out there talk about how you get to be where the gods are at. You get to be where the spiritual pathways are to find life. It's all about you earning and working and trying to get where the divine might be or where enlightenment might be or whatever it is. But scripture from Genesis to Revelation is a story arc of God coming to become one of us. So we might be where he is. God humbles himself. You know, think about it. You're, you're, you're on the throne. And to say that he humbled himself means he left his, his throne room of heaven to become human with all the physical flaws that we have. Jesus, did he get a cold? I'm sure he did. Did he stub his toe? 100%, right? Like he became one of us. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. He didn't stop being God, but he became human. Hebrews 2 puts it like this. Hebrews 2.14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. And only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. This is not like fear of death so much as it's a metaphor for Spiritual death. This is separation from God for all eternity. Verse 16. We also know the Son did not come to help angels. Very important key here, okay? He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Who are those? Are the Jewish people? Yes. We did a whole sermon series last year in November. We talked about the importance of Israel and the Jewish people and God's plan. Yes, the Jewish people. However, it's also pretty clear in Scripture that Abraham has many spiritual descendants as well, right? And that would include all those who follow after Christ. So he's come to help us as well, who are believers in Jesus. Therefore, it's necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so he can be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. This is him dying on the cross. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, look at this last part, he is able to help us when we are being tested. 
Boy, this is a loaded passage. I don't have time to break all that down here this morning, but here's what I want to, I just want to touch base on. Jesus ate and slept and bled and suffered and laughed and cried. He was like us in every way, in every respect. And that means what? It means that when you pray, think about it like this. When you pray, you are not praying to some elitist God who's way up there in his high horse kind of peering down at the little people and he can't relate to you. You are praying to somebody who who gets it. Now, this is probably somewhat borderline controversial, but I want you to think about it like this. I've, I've, I've gone here before with you, and uh, if you haven't heard it this way before, uh, listen up. God, before he becomes one of us, he can observe everything. He can watch. He can watch Adam and Eve sin. He can walk in the garden and be with them but he didn't experience it. He can watch Noah labor to build the ark and all the things that kind of happened with that. He can watch Jeremiah as he's preaching and no one's listening and he gets beaten and thrown down into a well. He can watch Samson with all the temptations he's got, you know, with women and everything else, you know, put his hands against the pillars and destroy the Philistines. He, he, can, he can watch David do his stuff. God observed all kinds of things, but God never lived it. And I don't know about you, but there's a difference between explaining to somebody, hey, here's what I'm going through, and then talking to someone who's actually been where you've been. You actually experience what you experience. That's a whole different level of relationship, right? And so what does God do? When he becomes one of us, he experiences life as we live it. He went where we went. He walked as we walked. He says, well, I don't think he understood anything we're going through. Pastor, this is 2024. With all the technology we have, i got to tell you, humanity's changed not one bit. You can go all the way back to the garden in Genesis, Genesis chapter 2 with Adam and Eve, man. Humanity is the same. We have the same struggles, the same temptations, the same issues, the same pride, the same everything. Technology's not changed the human element. We're still the same. Jesus experiences life on earth. And for the first time, he knows what it's like to walk through a situation and think, man, how will people judge me if I say this? Uh, what will happen if, if I give in to this decision over here? He had the temptations. He never gave in to temptation, but he experienced it. I, you know, I think fear worked with Christ the same way temptation did. He didn't let fear control him. He didn't let fear into his life, but he felt fear the way he felt temptation. I'll give you an example. We're in the Garden of Gethsemane. The night he's going to be arrested, and he's so stressed out about what lay ahead, his capillaries burst in his forehead, and the blood mixes with the sweat glands, and he sweats actual blood. It's a rare condition, but it happens when you're under extreme duress. And he sweats blood, and he's asking God, is there another way? Give me another way out. Find something, find a different way for me. Now, he comes back and says, not my will, but your will be done, right? So he settles on God's will, but he's freaking out because he knows what, what lays ahead. Like, he experienced that. When, he, when he's with Lazarus, his, his close friend Lazarus dies, and he's laid into a tomb, and Jesus hears about it. He breaks down and he, and he has an emotional response. He breaks down and just weeps and he sobs. And everyone says, man, look how much he loved him. And we like to say that Jesus cried because he felt the pain of death. Well, that's somewhat true, somewhat true. But I think for the first time, it all kind of hit maybe. Maybe not the first time, but certainly it came to a head at this point where Jesus had witnessed enough death in his life, right? Enough suffering. Uh, uh, he witnessed the power that sin held on humanity and the results of that. He had watched it from afar from his throne, but now he's living it, and now he experienced it, and now he's got the emotion, and he can't take it. And John says, an anger swelled up in him. He was angry at the power sin and death held, and it broke him, and he just begins to weep, not for the death, but for the power that sin held. Had. He had not experienced sense power to that extent before, but now as a man, he could. There's just something different about it. And so when you pray to God and you go to Christ, man, listen, he understands what you're going through. He hears your prayer. He gets it. I understand. I understand the stress you got. I've been there. I know what it's like to lose a loved one. I've been there. I understand that you're afraid of this. I know what that's like. But hey, I, I will help you because I know how to help you. It's just a whole different element. It changes how I pray. It changes how I think about God. It changes your relationship. When you fully understand and embrace that God 
surely was one of us and lived life as we live it. He understood what betrayal was like. I don't have time to get there today, but Zechariah chapter 11, it details what Judas would do. You know, Judas betrays Jesus with 30 pieces of silver. Well, that's just, you know, coincidence. No, sir. Zechariah 11, it details 30 pieces of silver, right? It details that silver would be used to buy a potter's field. What happens with Judas? He, he betrays Christ with 30 pieces of silver. He uses the money to buy a potter's field, and he hangs himself because he is so guilt-ridden with what he's done, he can't live with himself any longer. He understands what that kind of stuff's like. So my hope is in Christ, in part because he's like me and he gets it. He's lived life as I've lived it. I'm praying to a God who understands where I've been, who experienced pain and tears and anxiety because he's one of us. And he knows how to answer our prayers and to comfort us and to lead us. He knows how to bring hope to a hopeless situation because he's like us. I'm just telling you guys, it's one thing to say that, yeah, I know he's fully God and fully man, but when you actually embrace that and you actually understand that, I'm telling you, it changes how you relate to God. It just changes everything. Zechariah 6 paints a picture of someone more than the average person. Verse number 13, we read that Jesus Christ is also going to be our king. Yeshua is a king, right? He's a king. Zechariah 9.9, 9, we read about an event where Christ is coming into Jerusalem and, and he's riding on a donkey. Zechariah mentions the Messiah would do that. Details how Messiah will come in on, on, on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey, right? On, on Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, we celebrate what we call the triumphal entry, where Jesus comes in riding on a donkey and everyone hails him as a king. And they all shout Hosanna, and it's all just kind of this great little party that they celebrate Christ coming in to Jerusalem on that day. And he had one mission that week when he entered the city. That one mission was, I gotta die. I'm coming in to die for my people. So they might have life. But, you know, but think about being a king for a second. Like when you're the king, you have absolute authority. Like as king, all the power resides in you. There are no elections when you're the king. <laughs> there are no committees. There, there's no nothing. Like you're it. Your word is law and it's final. You have power over everything. Jesus as king, he has power over everything as well, including power to forgive sin. You know, he, he's all often questioned in scripture. Like, by what authority are you doing these miracles? By what authority do you drive out demons from people, you know? And, and the one that got all the Pharisees in a hissy fit was, was the one that you find in Luke chapter 5, where Jesus has a paralyzed man that's brought to him. And he looks at the man and goes, hey, your sins are forgiven. And, and, and the man's healed. And they all just kind of watch that and they freak out. Whoa, 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 whoa. The only person with power and the authority to forgive sin is God himself. And Jesus' response is, yeah, <laughs> how about that? Just so you know that I have that authority to forgive sins, he looks at the man lying down. Pick up your mat and go home. And he gets up and takes off. Like he has the authority to forgive sin. He has the power to forgive your deepest and darkest wrongs. Some of you this morning, man, you guys who are watching on like, you need that. You need a Jesus moment in your life today. You say, well, I thought I dealt with this issue for a long, but it keeps coming back to me, Pastor. Like, I still feel bad about this. I still feel guilt over this. I still feel shame over this. Why? Well, did God forgive you? Well, yeah, he forg have you accepted that forgiveness? That's, that's, that's the important question. Because I think we understand that he forgives us, but we don't accept it a lot of times. Accept the forgiveness that God has for you. That will change your entire outlook. That will change your life. He has the power to do so. If he's forgiven you, it's done. He's the one that can give you the brand new start. And because he's king... Boy, he's got, he's got authority over death. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. This is Jesus speaking here. He says, I'm the living one. I died. But look, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. He has the final authority over death, which means what? He has final authority over your eternal destination. It is not in your hands, it's actually in his hands. It's based off of what you do, for sure. You have to decide to follow Christ or not, but he has authority over that. And it means this, those who follow Christ, you have victory over death as well. Not that you're not going to die. It's appointed for man to die. We're all going to experience death in this life. But there is an eternal 
life on the other side of this that we have access to because of Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that, that resurrection that we celebrate on Easter is the seal of victory over death and the grave. Zechariah, by the way, he doesn't just give a picture of a coming king to Jerusalem the first time, you know, the triumphal entry and the donkey. He actually goes further. Zechariah is going to give you a picture of Jesus Christ returning as king. Now, he's, he's coming back at some point. Another message series for another day, you know, uh, but he's going to come back. And what's that like when he returns? Well, Zechariah gives you a picture. Zechariah 14, we get this image of Jesus returning, defeating darkness for good. Zechariah 14, 9. The Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, there'll be one Lord. And his name alone will be worshipped. Actually talks about how his feet will be on the Mount of Olives and all that kind of, like all that imagery is there in Zechariah 14. You think that's Revelation? No, that starts here in Zechariah. So this is, this is part of a bigger picture where Jesus Christ reigns forever when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that what? Philippians 2.10 says that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord. And you might say, well, Pastor, I'm just not sure where, I, where I'm, I'm at with Jesus today. I'm not sure where I stand with God and that kind of thing. And I, and I get you, that's where you're at today. I've, I've been there and many of the folks in the room have been there too. But there will come a point where even those who aren't sure if you enter into eternity without Christ, not sure where you want to land on this thing yet, one day you will bow that knee, you're going to bend the knee, and you're going to say, you're the king. You're the Lord. Now at that point, it's too late. If you've not made the decision in this life that Christ is Lord, you don't get a second chance once it's all been confirmed in eternity. And this, this is your shot to do it here. Uh, you know, th th there should be a little sense of urgency about that. And uh, this is our opportunity to do that, this, this side of heaven. But Christ as king gives me hope that my God can do anything. Why? Because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And Jesus is rising up to heaven in Matthew 28, 18. He says, I, he tells his followers, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, right? So here, now that I have that authority, here's what you guys do. You go out and you baptize people and you teach them about me and you make disciples. Because Christ is our, 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 our one of us and experienced life as we did because he is the king of kings and lord of lords, right? The power of his sin and death. He can give us new life. But there's another office he holds this morning too that I just want to touch base on. And it's another one that gives me hope today. It's from Zechariah chapter 6 where Christ is our priest who makes us right with God. He's our priest who makes us right with God. What does it mean to be made right with God, right? Like you might sit there this morning and say, gosh, I don't know what that means to be made right with God. Like, pastor, I'm a pretty good person. I've done a lot of really good things. Like, where's the disconnect between God and I? Uh, you could be Mother Teresa, <laughs> all right? The, what we would consider the moral authority, I mean, almost perfect in this life, all the good things you do, and there's still a disconnect between you and God. And the reason for that is that, you know, Romans talks about it. We're all born into sin. Because of Adam's sin in Genesis, and Adam being the first of humanity, we are all tainted with that. You say, you don't believe people are born good. I know, because Scripture tells me that we're born, we're, we're born uh, in, into sin. And as a parent, experience tells me, <laughs> and none of my kids, the first thing my kids learn is the word no. <laughs> they they, they got to learn. Like, we, you're all, you're meant to be that way, right? We, we all need Jesus because of that. And so because we start off that way, no matter how much good we do, it can't outweigh the sin. And our, at the end of the day, sin outweighs that. Being tainted with sin outweighs that. So no, it's not enough just to be good. There's, the, there's a disconnect. And the only way you're made right with God is by putting your faith in Jesus who took our punishment for us, who, who took the wrath of God for us, the judgment of God for us, so we could be made right with God. He bridges the gap. When he died and when he rose again, he was given authority over, over sin. And he takes your case before God. And I just want you to know how this plays out. 
Like, you know, you're, you're, you're living a life of sin or you're doing the wrong thing, whatever it is. And, and you've got Jesus over here who intercedes on your behalf before God the Father. It looks like this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. Because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he's able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. Now look at this last line. The job of the priest was to intercede for the people to, to, uh, uh, on their behalf to God. Right? So the priest has the sacrifice. He goes into what's called the Holy of Holies and he prays and he intercedes on behalf of the people to God. He does it one time a year on the Day of Atonement. Jesus, as our priest, does it all the time. He lives, Hebrews says, forever to intercede with God on their behalf, on our behalf, okay? So when I go to Jesus, who's the priest, I mean, he approaches God and he goes, hey, you know what? Here's the deal. Like, this guy right here, Andrew, is ready, man. Like, he's, he's coming to me and he's, he's, he's admitting he needs me to be his savior and he wants me to be his Lord. So God, I got this, right? I've got this. I'll take care of it. I died and rose again. Uh, he's putting his faith in me. So I'm going to forgive him of his wrong and what he's done. He's one of mine now because he's one of mine. He's, he's an heir as Romans talks about. We were just in Romans all year this year. As Romans talks about, he's an heir. All the promises that are given to me, they're also given to him. He's got a place here now, God. And all of a sudden now, you're part of God's kingdom. And then whenever something happens, I need God to show up. I need God to forgive me. Jesus is the one who's right there pleading his case to God on my behalf. Putting his case to God for me. Making me right with God. Romans 3.22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Listen to me carefully this morning. We're made right by placing our faith in Jesus. The only way to get to God is through Christ. And maybe you're here today, you're watching, and you said, Pastor, listen, I, I'm hearing what you're saying, but I just, can't, I just can't buy it. There's so many pathways out there. There's so many ways to get spiritual health, enlightenment, God, whatever. I can't buy this Jesus thing is the only way. I'm just telling you, Jesus makes the claim himself. John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. Like, he is the way to get to God. Now, I can't make decisions for you. I can only share my experience with you. I, I was a skeptic, and I was kind of where some of you were at. And I came to the conclusion that, no, I think this stuff is right. And I threw my lot in with Jesus, and I've been changed ever since. But he's the only way to go. He's our high priest who takes up our case, intercedes before the Father. And here's the best news that I love about this. Anybody can come to know Jesus. The invitation is open. We, we live in, a, in an era in our culture right now where everything's about identity and demographic. What's your skin color? What sex are you? What gender are you? How do you vote? What social class are you? We divide people up under a thousand different ways. To my knowledge and my experience, limited though it might be on this earth through 39 years, the only thing I can, I've seen that can just bust through every demographic barrier out there is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It don't matter what skin color you are. It doesn't matter what social class you belong to or economic class. It doesn't matter your education level. It doesn't matter who you vote for. The invitation to accept Jesus Christ is open to everybody. You will not be able to stand before God one day and say, well, you know, those people at Radiant Church did not let me in. You know, I just didn't get there. You're not going to be able to do that. Because the invitation is open to everybody. No one can keep you from coming to know Christ. That's the only person to keep you from coming to know is, is yourself. Once you've been presented with this gospel, that's, you're the only one that can do it. It's open to everybody. Now, I want to tell you this. I want to share this with you, though. God will accept you and say, hey, come as you are. 100% true. Come as you are. Bring your baggage. Bring your junk. Bring your struggles. Bring your lifestyle. Bring everything with you. But I will tell you this, and this is where people have a really hard time. This is where people, if you read the Gospels, you had a lot of followers. And they said, man, this teaching's too hard for us. They walked away. This is, where, this is where it gets tough. He invites you to come as you are. He loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. He will change you. 
He'll change you, man. That's how you get guys who are like, yeah, dude, I struggled with alcohol for 20 years, but I haven't picked up a bottle in the last five. Why? J Jesus changed me. I just, I don't have that desire anymore. He began, he, began, he began to work in my life. I'm just different. I used to go downtown every Thursday night and do what I was going to do, and, but now that I started following Christ, just over time, I began to realize that, you know, that's just, I don't feel the same euphoria. I don't feel the same excitement. It just, it just feels empty in me now. And I've, I've got this purpose that I can't put my finger on, but I got this purpose that just God seems to give me. I just, I just don't want to do that stuff anymore. I used to live this certain way with this lifestyle and do that kind of, but, but Jesus began to work inside of me. And I'm just, I'm different now. He changes you. He makes you more like himself. He makes you into the person he's called you to be and he knows you to be. Anybody can be made right with God. And here's what that tells me this morning. There's hope for you today. There's hope for you today. I've shared this story before. It's one of my favorite stories to share. I'll probably share it to my dying day. Pastor to church in the low country for, for, for many years. And there was a guy there, um, man, and, and I won't say his name because this goes out online and stuff. There was a guy there, man, he was super built, super ripped dude, man. Like always, I'm, I'm not a ripped guy, so I, I got a little insecure with that one. I'm like, oh man, don't shake this guy's hand, I'll break it. I don't know. It's this crazy big muscle dude. But, uh, but he, was, he was ripped, man, he was stoic. And he was, so he was a perfect usher. <laughs> like, he served as an usher, man. And, uh, but he was great. He was faithful, came to church all the time, helped out in events and ministries. And one day, I, we preached, I forget what sermon the sermon was, but the teaching was on a topic like this. And he pulled me aside after everything was done. He goes, Pastor, you know why, you know why I can say that anybody can have hope in Christ? And because and, and, we say stuff like that, right? We'll say things like, well, you know, he saved me, he can save you. Ha, ha, ha. Like, we're kind of like joking about that, but he, this is for real though, right? And he had tears in his eyes. Anybody can have hope. I said, no, no, why? He goes, because I spent many years, several years in prison because I killed a guy. I took someone else's life. And I never forgave myself. And I struggled with, I was a suicide watch or anything else. He just, I struggled with that. It ate away at me. I could And Jesus found me. And he gave me hope. And my life has been changed. I'm not the same. And if he can, if he can save me and give me hope, he can give anybody hope. I've never forgotten that. None of us in this room have done what that man did. But he stands today, if we're here, he stands today and tell you, I have hope because of what Christ did for me. And because I have it, you can have it. So no matter where you happen to be, if you feel you're too far gone, if you feel you're just not, whatever it is, hey, listen to me this morning. There's hope for you because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Hope has a name. Some of you today, you, you, you need that hope in your life, man. You need that in your life this morning. And I don't know what you came in with. No, I, I don't know what, if you're living defeated, I don't know what that looks like or what that feels like for you today. But I can tell you that I've been there. I understand what it feels like to be defeated. And, and living that kind of life is not the life that God has for you. He's got something more for you. He has something greater in store for you. He has hope that he wants to give you, which can change you forever. Christ being our hope is, is important. You know, he's our hope because he's one of us who lived life as we lived it and experienced life as we experienced it. And he can relate to what we're going through. Boy, that gives me hope because I'm not praying to a God who doesn't get it. Christ understands. But he's our hope because he's our king who has all authority to forgive sins. He has all authority to give life. He has all authority, man, to, to give peace. He's our hope because he's our priest who has the power to make us right with God, to wash away every sin. And he can be your hope if you allow him to be. Come as you are. He'll take you as you are, but you will leave changed. 
He loves you too much to keep you as you are. He begins to change your life. If you ever wanted to be the person that you know you can be, well, God is the one who makes that happen in your life. He's your hope. Bow your heads, close your eyes today in the room, all, all around the, the room this morning. If you're here today, you just say, you know, Pastor, all this talk about hope and Jesus, and I'll be honest today, I, I need Jesus in my life. Like, I, I would not call myself someone who's a Christian. But I, I do realize today that my life needs something different, and I, I think it's Jesus. What do I do? Very simple today, very simple. What we're going to do is this. We're going to pray a simple prayer for those of you who need Christ in your life. You don't have to repeat after me if you don't want to. It's, it's, it's one of those prayers I want you to say from the heart, but I'm going to model it for you. And all it is is a prayer that says, I'm going to make Christ my Savior. He's going to save me from my sin. And then I'm, I'm going to make him Lord of my life, meaning that I want Jesus to call the shots, and I want Jesus to be the one who leads me and guides me. And then I want to pray for those of us who are believers here uh, when, when we're finished with that, okay? So that's you. You say, Pastor, I, I need hope in my life here today. I need Jesus. And I want you to pray along with me in your own words. It's going to go like this. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I know I've done things, God, that, that you're not proud of. I, I, I'm not proud of how I live my life. And I know today that I, I, I need you. Boy, I feel at times defeated, and I feel at times hopeless. I need you to give me a purpose. I need you to give me some life. I, whatever it is you got, I need it, man. So I'm asking today that you will be my Savior. Will you save me, not just from sins, man, save me from myself. Be the Savior who can change my life. Be the Savior who can set me on a right path. Be a Savior who can give me a purpose. The purpose you designed for me. And I, I've lived my life <laughs> my own way, with my own choices, and I know how that ends up. And so I, I don't really want to continue that. So Jesus, from this day forward, will you be the Lord of my life? So what that means is, God, I'm, I, I want to follow after you. I, I want you to lead me. I, I don't want to call my own shots. You lead me, and you guide me. Man, will you take me where I'm supposed to go? Will you give me the purpose I'm supposed to live out? I, I, I will do this. I will, I will do all that I can to serve and follow you from this day forward. And if that means, God, there's changes in my life that have to happen. God, you have full authority. Change me. Get the junk out. Put in renewed hope and life and forgiveness and purpose. God, help me to be the person you're calling me to be. Change the things that I shouldn't be doing. Change the, the, the ways I shouldn't be living. God, just change me so I can become who I was meant to be. Be my Savior and be my Lord, I pray. Now, Lord, for those who are believers in the room, who are Christians today, maybe we're here and, and we feel hopeless, we feel defeated, we feel just discouraged today for different reasons. God, would you remind those who are already believers today where their hope resides, where that freedom resides, where that forgiveness comes from, man, where that victory is in. God, for those who aren't living a life of victory, man, turn it around today. We are children of God. We live and walk in victory. So God, I pray for those who feel defeated, that God, you would fill their hearts up with that love and that forgiveness and that freedom and the victory that you bled and died and rose again for May we know that we walk in purpose today with you. And I pray, God, this morning that as we continue to follow after you with all of our heart and all of our soul, and God, you would use us to do great things for your kingdom and for your glory, changing hearts and lives for you forevermore. We love you. We praise you. We ask all this in your mighty and precious name. Amen.